Tommy Tenney welcome this morning as he comes to address you. Why don't we make the King of Kings welcome this morning? Welcome, King. You rule. You reign. You rock. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I'd like to ask a question if I could. Just let me set it right there, Brian. Well, hello, Abe. We have Abraham in the building. It's great to look out and see some friends that are here, just people who are, are anointed to do what God's called them to do. You know what? It's, it's really important that you affirm the anointing. One of the ways that you do that is I, whenever I get in the car, well, let's back that up. I have three daughters, one of whom is 11. And when 11-year-olds start wearing perfume, <laughs> you don't have to ask whether they put any on or not. <laughs> when they get in the car with you, you know they are anointed. <laughs> you smell it on them. And... Uh, Sometimes, you know, I, uh, I might, you know, walk running out the door, heading for a service. I might forget to put a little bit of cologne on. And on occasion, I have been known to ask my wife, because, you know, you kind of, in your, in your mind, you can't always smell it on yourself. So I'll say, ask to my wife, I said, did, did I put on cologne? And, oh, yeah, you, you, you're, you're okay. So uh, it's nice to have it affirmed. I would like you to turn to your neighbor today and tell them, you smell anointed today. <laughs> now, if, if I had... If I had a hat, I would change hats right now. I need to change hats. For, for the most part, many of you sort of view me as a, you know, just, just a preacher. And that's true. I do not manage uh, a company, although I try to run my ministry on those same principles. And sometime back, I have regular staff meetings and have board meetings and all the normal things that go. We, I walked in and was trying to get some of my staff to think a little differently. I had uh, I brought every baseball hat that, that I had been given, and I'm not talking about the cool kind. I'm talking about you go to a men's conference and they have these screen printed truck driver hats or where, wherever it is. And, and I had about, I don't know, 10 or 20 of those. Just And I put them in our conference room. We had a marble table in there, and I, I put them all in a pile on the table and when all of my staff walked in and you know they're dressed kind of nice I said okay everybody put on a hat and these ladies who made sure their hair was nice I said put on the hat I sign your paycheck put on a hat <laughs> so they put on a hat and then uh, we all you know we, we talked a few minutes and they couldn't understand what what because what I was talking about had nothing to do with the hat and then I said now change hats and then I brought home to them the fact that sometimes you have to think differently. It's not just your department. It's, it's our whole ministry and what you do. And you need to wear their hat sometimes. And so if I could this morning, I want to change hats. You normally see me as, a, as somebody who stands up and uh, I open the Word of God and I, and I preach. And that is my passion. That's my calling. And I want to stay in that place. But at the same time... Uh, if, if I were to, from a secular viewpoint, list my uh, bio, it would, it would list the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, I negotiate multi-million dollar contracts. I, 
deal with all of these issues and, and trying to make all of those pieces come together, I often have to switch hats. And my office knows when I'm preparing to preach, don't call me about some administrative things. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have that hat on right now. But I want to put on a different hat. I want to talk to you about a, a different way of reaching people. Uh, the, the written word, and I'm not talking about the word of God, when you write your messages, and I had them stack some of the books that I've written up here. Uh, children's books. We took, how many of you read God, God Chasers? Well, we won't be selling many of those. <laughs> we saturated that market. In, in, how many of you have not read God Chasers? Oh, we're, we're safe. There's a few of you here. Uh, but chill, God Chasers for Children, 8, 9, 10. You've read it, Lori? The little one? Oh, for your boys, that's right. I'm not thinking. Uh, uh, God Chaser for Teenagers. How to Be a God Chaser and a Kid Chaser. That's for parents and moms. Uh, prayers of a God Chaser. Uh, and, and it goes on and on. Why do I do all of that? Number one, I'm one person. I can only be in one place. I can preach in one pulpit on a Sunday. And yet if, if I feel the need to reach more people, I have to find better ways to touch more people. I can't go home with you. I can't, I can't drink coffee with you and spend two hours. But, but I can. And that's by virtue of books and tapes. Now, to take it to the next level. So, so I, I, I could sort of sit back and say, well, you know, millions of books and touching a lot of people and I'm done. Or I can say, there's still more. There's more that I haven't touched. There are people who won't read a book. How do I touch them? There are people that won't read a nonfiction. There's two, there's various kinds of books. These, these books are all what you call nonfiction books. They are factual based. They're biblically based. But there are people who will not read nonfiction books. There are people who only read fiction books. They like to read the, somebody tell a good story. So I began to say, God, preaching is telling a story. And I, I, I try to tell. So I began to contemplate. I, I want to write a story. And the end result of all of that is I began to write the fictionalized account of the book of Esther. Now, just I'm talking from a business. How many of you are business people here today? Hold up your hand. Wow. We're in the right crowd. See, this, 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 this is the people. I began to, to talk about uh, writing a fiction book, and the publisher said, Tommy, we don't, you don't, we don't know if you'll sell fiction. We don't know if you know how to write fiction. So here's what we'll do. We want you to write a nonfiction book, and we want you to write, you can, you can also write your fiction book. So the fiction book becomes my missions outreach. And I said, okay, I'll do that, and we negotiate, and we said, I'll, I'll write the nonfiction. You can put that in the Christian section. That takes care of everything. But when I write the fiction book, I want front of store placement in the Barnes and the Nobles, the Books a Million, the uh, uh, Borders. I, 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 why? And they said, why? I said, you're a Christian publisher. If our, our, our goal is missions, help me reach people. There are people who will read a fiction book. And I told them, don't classify it just as Christian fiction. You've already eliminated a lot of the mark. Classify it as historical fiction. And I'm going to write about Esther. And so, I, I'm in the process where, where the rough draft is finished and the nonfiction book is 80% finished. It's been challenging. I've uh, been writing two books simultaneously. And it's uh, actually uh, had a good head start on it. Uh, where is Kiffin? Where's your wife? I thought I saw her. There she is. Uh, I have good friends. The The... They, they have to do missions work in Barbados, bless their hearts, pray for them. But we, I went and spent three days with the editors of the fiction book, uh, the nonfiction book, and my friend Matt Crouch, and we began to just, I, I spent, I don't know, 
maybe 18 hours or 20 hours over about three days and I taught them through the book of Esther sitting there with the ocean in our ears and uh, it was very inspiring just a small group and we had had incredible time from that there are now working and getting very close to the editing of all this, putting it all the pieces together. And uh, I, 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 I ripped, I didn't rip, I, I carefully pulled it out. This is the rough draft of the table of contents from the nonfiction book. Can, can I share a few little things with you from here? This is, uh, the title of the book is uh, Finding Favor with a King. First chapter is, from peasant to princess, what a difference a day makes. Second chapter, do you want the heart of the king or the splendor of the kingdom? Some people are just gold diggers. Protocol of the palace. Uh, another uh, chapter, intimacy and influence. In the... The understanding of that is with relationship comes access. With intimacy comes influence. Some people just want the influence and they don't want to work on the relationship. Um, how to court a king. What do you give a man who has everything? Uh, secrets of the Chamberlain. Uh, favor has a partner and the partner's called purpose. Everybody prays for favor. They say, I want, every, I want you to like me. I want everybody to like me. Then, then suddenly they get favor, and they, decide, they discover that favor is not the highest calling, that after everybody likes you, then God's going to say, do you have a purpose? What are you going to do with the favor I've given you? And favor has a partner, and that partner's called purpose. Uh, another chapter, uh, risk and reward. Do you know how you spell faith? R-I-S-K. I, I need some good amens on that. <laughs> that's, that's businessmen talking there. They understand that. Uh, another chapter, worshiping with your enemy. You've never worshiped until you've had to worship with the enemy sitting at the same table. When Esther had dinner with the king, Haman was sitting right there, and she had to learn to ignore the enemy and focus on the king. You've never worshipped until you've worshipped with a bad diagnosis from the doctor in your pocket. You've never worshipped until you've looked at the profit and loss statements and they're going down and you say, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to hold up my ethics, I'm going to do what God... You've never worshipped until... Don't pay attention to the enemy. Focus on the king. Oh, sorry, wrong hat. Uh, <laughs> uh, another chapter. Indulgent worship makes for a sleepless king. And that's about divine insomnia. God has insomnia. He can't sleep. Do you know what causes God? Have you ever, ate, have you ever eaten too much? And you try to go to bed at night after you've eaten too much and you just say, oh... How long has it been since God has left one of your worship encounters and he said, I can't sleep. Oh man, why? I am so stuffed on worship. When the king left the banquet with Esther, Esther chapter 6 verse 1 says, On that night could not the king sleep. She had so stuffed him at the banquet until he couldn't sleep. What does a king do when he can't sleep? He checks the records and he plans your reward. On that night could not the king sleep, and he called for the records to be read to him. And while they were reading the records, they found out that a man named Mordecai had aborted a plot on the king's life. And the king said, what have we done for him? And he said, well, it doesn't appear that we've done anything. And the king stayed up all night planning Mordecai's reward. Interestingly, Haman stayed up all night that night planning Mordecai's demise. And Haman came in to ask the king, can I have Mordecai killed? When he walked in, the king said, Haman, what would you do for a man whom the king wants to honor? 
And, Morde and Haman thought, that's me. And so he had his dream day created. He said, I want to wear the king's robe. I want to be led around on the king's horse. And I want a high dignitary to do it. And the king said, that's exactly. Haman, there's a man named Mordecai. Indulgent worship makes for a sleepless king. If I can get you to worship, then you can sleep at night and the king will work the night shift and he'll plan all night, how can I reward you? Yes. Wrong hat. Anyway, so the, the, the story of Esther, I've just been, I've been, you can tell it, I'm living, I'm breathing it, it's, it's, it's working in me. And, 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 and the publishers, they're all excited and, and uh, I don't know, maybe you're excited too. Uh, I, this will not be out till September, but then about next March, I believe, the fiction book will be released. And it's a fictionalized telling. And I want you to pray with me. I'm going to be really honest with you. I want this fiction book to hit the New York Times bestseller list. You know why? There will be people who will never walk into a Christian bookstore, who won't even walk into the Christian section. That's about that big at Barnes & Noble. And they, they, won't, they, they, they won't do any of that. But they'll walk in and they see, hmm, what is this? One night with a king. That looks good. And housewives will take it home. And bankers will take it home. And it's not overtly preaching the gospel. It's covertly preaching the gospel through a historical fiction. You know, you can tell the truth in a fiction book. And we tell the truth. And then... When I began to talk to some other people about it, one particularly who I'm going to introduce right now named Matt Crouch, he said, Tommy, that doesn't just need to be a book. That needs to be a movie. <laughs> and then quite honestly, I began to feel overwhelmed and it dawned on me that the pulpit is changing. And it's not just what you say standing behind this desk. But it's what goes home. I can preach to people in the privacy of their own home. And then there are people who, who won't read, but they will go to a movie. And what if, and, and don't, don't, don't go, if, if God wills and everything works out, it looks like it's doing fine. Matt's going to talk to you about why he's doing what he's doing and what, why, why the king and the businessman have to work together. But there will be, it's not an overt preaching. You're not going to, you're not going to even see me in a movie if it works. You're not, you, 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 may, you may have to look for it, but just like people watch Lord of the Rings and they realize there's something, there's a hidden meaning here. We want the hidden anointing to create a hunger in their hearts where they realize, where do I find out more about this? And if you've read the nonfiction book, then you can explain the fiction book. And there's a divine synergy and there's a linking there. The pulpit is changing. Your business place is changing. You don't only spread the gospel by a guy in a suit and tie on Sunday morning and where you lasso people and make them sit there and listen to it. In your boardrooms, in your business meetings, somebody was speaking with yesterday said on a conference call, they were asked about things. It's okay to be a preacher. You don't have to wear a tie just like I don't have to wear a hat to find favor with the king. Amen? I want to introduce to you a, a spiritual entrepreneur. My friend, Matt Crouch, is a very creative, is it left brain or right brain? I can't even ever remember. But he, he's just glad he has one. He has an anointing. Thank you. Good morning. In television, we're not supposed to use um, pulpits, so I'm kind of uncomfortable being behind one. That's Tommy's uh, gig to be able to be behind a pulpit, so I'm trying to find a way to get around it so that I can get closer to you. But good morning. Um, I have not a cohesive address, I have little bits and pieces that I want to um, kind of put out there, little, little portions. And somebody has to tell me how long I have because I so can go too long quickly. So how, for real, 90 seconds, right. 
<laughs> then all I'm going to do is just give it to my wife, Lori, because everyone wants to hear her talk. She, then nobody wants to hear. What time do we, for real, what time do we have to leave? 30 minutes. Okay, go. Um, first of all, is it bad when the senior pastor comes in and leans over to you and says, I'm going to a funeral? Is that bad when you're about to speak? Was he covertly saying anything about me or what I was going to say or that was weird yeah on occasion but I'd probably trip over all those cords okay let me get out there thank you that's better here are my notes I wrote them while I was sitting down there you're, you're in charge your 90 seconds are up bro yeah. we appreciate you being here you know, you know what, I'm more comfortable down here anyway. Apparently a few of you saw the program that we did together. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look, I'm really good at embarrassing people, so be nice to me, okay? And now that I'm coming down, uh, we have the daughter of Zion here. She's going to do a song for us this morning. Just stand and sing, please. No, I'm kidding. See, I'll do that to anybody at any time, so just be nice. I was personally changed when I heard Rich Marshall, okay? The reason that I'm here, the reason that I uh, culminated any influence I have at Trinity to be able to put that incredible program together that we did uh, was because Tommy got me to come here rich. and. Businessmen, wave, wave your hand at me real quick. Women, businessmen and women. Um, I knew this teaching, but I just never heard anyone say it before. Is that kind of the way? I, I mean, I knew that when I was in my office, which is mainly talking to agents and Hollywood talent agencies and producers and directors and negotiating contracts, ultimately, the point is to tell a story to change people in the nations and into the generations, okay? That's ultimately what I'm doing. But I sit behind a desk like a lot of you. And that's ultimately, somebody's phone's ringing. Kiffin, do you want to get it? No? It's probably for me. Let me just, uh... hi, Tammy. How are you? You know, um... I'll never forget Peter crumpling the $100 bill on uh, television and throwing it into the crowd. Do you remember that? Did you see that? That was awesome. Um, so ultimately, the reason that I wanted to be here today is to basically be a testimony that I did not understand the dynamic of anointed for business or let's say it this way, I did understand it, I knew it in my spirit, but I just never heard anyone speak it. So I was ultimately changed, for real, Rich. I mean, it was a, it was a big deal to me. And that was last uh, Thanksgiving, I guess, in Dallas, Texas. I went and Tommy uh, brought me and what I did with Rich's address, and, and it's something that I would encourage others to do, I took the audio tape of Rich's address, and I brought the top guys and gals from my staff to my home, and we all sat around in my house and listened to it together. And we were able to stop the tape on occasion, and then, you know, I would interject something, or somebody would say, stop the tape and listen to it. So all of that um, was the way that I got my own staff understanding this from that ultimate address that I heard for the first time. So, first of all, Tommy is probably the best person at promoting and preaching all at the same time I've ever seen. You understand that ultimately what we are attempting to do is to get the message of the gospel out beyond the four walls of churches, beyond the four walls of of places of assembly like this and we do that through television we do that through books we do it through ultimately film 
in 1998, the Lord put on my wife and I's heart to take the message of the gospel in a place that it had never been done. Billy Graham has made movies, and we all understand that there has been the cross and the switchblade. There's been movies like that uh, that have been created and, and filmed. But never has a Christian film been put into the business of the theatrical distribution mechanism, okay? Now, for what that means is there are guys that own theaters, okay? AMC, Regal, Cinemark, all these big theater chains. There's 30,000 uh, theater chains. So the equivalent of that, if you have a business and you sell into grocery stores, you would ultimately know how many grocery stores there are in the United States or around the world, whatever. So I know how many places that what my business creates, I know ultimately how many places it can go. There are 30,000 movie houses. By coincidence, there are 300,000 churches in the United States. And interestingly enough, who holds more influence over the world? The 30,000 screens or the 300,000 churches? You know? And uh, so ultimately, I think the, the message of the gospel that goes out into these theaters, the Omega Code, how many uh, saw the Omega Code, the movie? Just kind of wave it, uh, wave it at me. So I'd say that's about half. And, uh, and Megiddo also. Uh, did, did anyone see the other one that we did ch way back, China Cry? Do you remember that one? <laughs> Okay, that was, that was our first attempt at, at doing that. But what the difference was in 1999, what happened, and this is the, the one uh, business thing that was extraordinarily dynamic. Okay, this is why over a thousand articles were written about the Omega Code. That's why I was interviewed on every news service there is to be interviewed on. Literally at the end of the first week, I'd lost my voice. I'd done some of the interviews. And what was amazing about it is we put the Omega Code, I convinced theaters, and I said there's something changing in, and I didn't use the term body of Christ because they wouldn't have understood that, but I was saying something's changing in the church. My dad and his generation, and there are a few of you of my dad's generation in here, his mother told him sincerely, and my dad says it this way, sincerely wrong, but sincerely told him that if he went into a movie theater and watched Roy and Dale ride their horses and the Lord came back, he'd go right to hell, right from that spot, right then. And we had a mindset that if we took I believe, and, and, I, and I'm preaching a little bit of what my dad has told me. This is not my uh, ultimate, um, you know, I'm not trying to preach this. I'm just kind of communicating something to you. My dad says it this way. I think uh, that there was a misinterpretation of one of the scriptures saying, be ye separate from the world. And that meant let the world have the movie theaters let the world have the story and think of the bizarre thing think of this it's the very medium that jesus did matthew 13 open up your bibles to matthew 13 it says in the headline in some bibles a long storytelling afternoon for jesus and whenever he was trying to communicate a message of the kingdom of god he told a story and used dirt and planting seeds and this and that and the other thing to really make his point. And I think that is the ultimate change. So in 1999, my lovely wife and I, as the movie was being finished, Trinity Broadcasting, which is ultimately the partners of Trinity Broadcasting, funded the creation of the movie, which was seven, roughly seven million dollars, seven and a half million dollars. So Trinity did the movie and then my dad then i as a entrepreneur i suppose i said well let's put the movie into the theaters and my dad said no let's not put it in the theaters 
you never make any money there and it's just this big mess and everyone's so crooked in that business and stuff and I said well then dad if if that means that you're not gonna put it into the theaters then I would like to acquire the rights which in my dad's mind was a fishing license you know just because you buy a fishing license doesn't mean you're gonna catch anything and ultimately what I did is I said to my dad if I can get the money put together if I can acquire the right influence, if I can make the right call, if I can get Sonny from AMC Theaters to book the prints, can I do that? And he thought, well, it's no skin off my nose. If you can get it done, go get it done. There's the key component. A generation that will go beyond. Bless my, heart, my dad's heart and the partners and the, and the supporters of Trinity. They created the film. So I had a big spool of film now but that was only going to air on Christian television unless I went into the business world it was not going to go anywhere else and I'm wondering would that have been preaching to the choir as it were somebody nod at me if you understand preaching to the choir okay um, actually what was so funny about preaching to the choir remember when we were on TV together somebody said something about losing weight and uh, do you remember that? Somebody said, somebody got into losing weight. And uh, I said, that puts a, a new meaning on preaching to the choir. And we all looked around and kind of sucked in a little bit, you know. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we ultimately went into the, into the theaters. And what was, so, what was so different about it is Hollywood... You know what? They spend, you ready for this? You know what the average budget for a movie is? Now, $30 million. That's the average budget. Many get done less than that. Many do. Some, much more. Guess what, though? That's changed. That Hollywood doesn't want you to know this. The average marketing budget since 1990 has gone from $7 million that they spend on marketing. Okay, the average budget for a movie to be marketed to tell you to go see it, $40 million. Okay? Lori and I had 600000 We got that by remortgaging our home. And so we had a decision to make, businessmen, businesswomen. Somebody said something about risk. We remortgaged our home and we signed remortgage papers on our business and on our home and we said we are either here in Hollywood to change the nations and the generations or we're sincerely wrong in what we're doing and I said it this way we're not out on a limb we're not putting our business and our family my two boys are sitting right here stand up on your chairs real quick these two boys right here there they are these two boys and my lovely wife and I made the decision. Actually, we told the kids we were going to do it. We didn't allow them to actually participate in that decision. <laughs> and we said, you know what? We're not putting ourselves out on a limb. We're either in the right tree or the wrong tree. And there's a big difference. You're either called into business or, as this conference I'm sure has been saying, you're called into the priesthood. And so what we did is we remortgaged everything we could possibly do. And with our, you know, little tiny marketing budget of $600,000, we told AMC Theater there's a shift in, and I would do this, I would say, call them whatever you want to call them. Call them churchgoers. Call them people of faith. Whatever label you want to say. You go ahead and put your own label on it. But what I'm telling you is there's a generation of people that are not misinterpreting the be ye separate from the world. We are to engage this world into every single form of communication. How many realize that Christian radio only became popular when someone called Billy Graham started preaching over it? Prior to that, the you know, the minister better not have found out you had a radio in your house. That's the way it was in my mom and dad's home, okay? And they just, they wouldn't have a radio, and if they did, they wouldn't let the preacher know. Then all of a sudden,
Billy Graham got a really good idea. Well, let's preach over the thing, okay? And then all of a sudden, what happened with television? It was just the one-eyed demon. You remember the name for TV, the one-eyed demon? And then all of a sudden, that kind of changed when Pat Robertson got the first license for a station in Virginia. My dad got, I think, the second or third license in Los Angeles. Funny business story. This is a business conference. Uh, my dad asked my, my brother and I, okay, boys, the Lord's calling us into something different, and uh, you want, we're, I'm considering one of two things. I'm either going to buy a TV station or I'm going to buy a vending machine business. <laughs> that's, that's the honest to God truth. I'm not joking you. Okay, when I was 11 years old, my dad said to me, boys, and we were sitting there at the kitchen table, I'm either going to go buy Channel 40 in Los Angeles or I'm going to buy vending machine businesses. And we said, oh, buy the vending machine business. Are you kidding? We'll get to collect all the coins and restock it with candy and all, you know. Um, of course, we wouldn't have done the smoking one. You know, we wouldn't have done the cigarette ones. But you guys, you guys have been talking serious stuff, man. It's Saturday morning, I guess. Um, by the way, let me just have my lovely wife stand up real, real quick. You know what? No one really cares about me. And ultimately, all they want to do is hear from Lori. And uh, that was Tamara telling me to sit down. Good morning. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you I love you. That's about it. You know, I, I do have to say something, though. Tommy gave us a little teeny tiny rough draft of One Night with the King, the fiction book. And what you probably didn't know, Tommy, is that you would give like one or two pages of, of a couple chapters, and so I'd flip the page and there'd be one sentence. And I couldn't read anymore because it wasn't there. So I kind of got mad because I didn't have the rest of the book. But I'm telling you what, God promised us entrance into the hearts of the ungodly without them knowing it. Now, how many know that there are seekers all over this world? They are searching, they're seeking, they're going to every kind of God, which there's only one. So they're going to the wrong ones if, they're, if they actually exist. But there are seekers, and so if they go to a movie where you're sitting there in the dark and you soak up everything that's on that screen... It's, it's a dark, it's intimate, it's, you know, and you just sit there and just, you know. <laughs> How many know that if you're preaching the gospel inside of a story like Jesus did, his word does not return void. And so it's going to, and those seekers are going to see God in there. And everybody was made with a treasure inside of them. Everybody's made after the image of God, and so that is going to cry out, and we're going to reach the world with the gospel, and every arts there is possible. And I just want to say I love you, and it's so good to be. I've never been to Brownsville, so this is great for me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I have 10 minutes, right? T tighten it up. Here we go. So what I ultimately had to find out were we in the right tree or the wrong tree? Businessmen, have you ever hit that wall where you, where you risked everything? I mean, it, you know, there's some stories I'm sure in this room that are amazing. I'm sure pastors have a lot of stories where you just, you get to the point in your, in your walk with God where ultimately he, he so, you know, I believe the, the definition of humility is just the, the realization that the pathway was created ultimately before the foundation of the earth and we're just walking down that pathway that God created. I'm not pushing anything. I'm not creating anything. I'm simply walking a path that God created. He created us as a purpose and a destiny and we just simply need to find the right road. But what God did for us in 1999 is he put a stake in the ground and he said, good job. You found the stake in the right road and Undoubtedly, you're in the right tree. Our very first theatrical motion picture that I'm credited as the producer on, that we risked our home and our business, 
was the number one independent film of 1999 of any movie in Hollywood at all. Okay? It was the number one limited release movie of all movies. It was the 106th highest grossing picture of all movies in Hollywood of that year in 1999. Because you went. And you know what? That's ultimately what I told the theaters you would do. I was praying you would, and you did. And I thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Dear Jesus, thank you. And, uh, and so ultimately, we, you couldn't convince me that I'm not supposed to be living in Hollywood, dealing with agents, lawyers, and stuff. Dealing with stuff. That's what I do. I deal with stuff. Okay? That's what I do. And then when Rich Marshall told me that I was anointed to be there, I knew that. But you know what? It set me free. It was a validation of what this is all about. I'm testifying to what this is all about. This anointed for business conference, I'm just here to say, I, I'm one of you. You know, I was set free. I mean, no kidding. And then to ultimately realize the way to take that to the next level is to link with a priest to take a message. When a, when a king and a priest link together, okay, this, you, something strange is happening here. I, I optioned Dr. Bill Bright's book, Blessed Child, and I, am assu I assumed that that one would be the next, I, I'm actually in production on, a, on an animated feature right now that will be done later this year. The, it's a parable that Jesus told, hmm, uh, the prodigal son. And it's an animated feature film, 72 minutes in length, about 25 minutes of it is done. And it's set in kind of a Star Trek environment. So it'll be for the kids and the teenagers and it's a, it's a wonderful animated feature that'll be in the theaters. But the next live action, what we call it, filmed movie that we do, I think is going to be this Esther project. I believe that and something's going on. And think of the connection now. When I finally get a, when I get the understanding of what this conference is teaching and, and, and it starts permeating inside of me and then Tommy and I start talking about the concepts of taking this and then he writes the manual for the movie, okay? Think of, think of what Tommy's doing. He's taking this whole theatrical marketplace movie thing to the next level. He's writing a nonfiction book that will be in your hands before the movie comes out. My vision that Lori and I have to go into the theatrical marketplace will have a manual in your hands because it's complete. Are you ready for this? I believe purpose and destiny will always be locked up in someone else. Maybe that's the point of kings and priests. Maybe there's the, there's the understanding that my destiny and my purpose will always be flowing through someone else. So ultimately, I can be doing what I'm doing. I have to fill theaters or the theaters won't book the print. Okay, the, the movie, when it's done, is a piece of film. Literally, it's just this big thing. Okay, they will not say we'll run it unless I can convince them that you'll show up. So my purpose and destiny is locked up inside of you. Okay, now when you go, that means someone else's destiny is locked up. And what we're doing now, think of it, it's complete when you bring someone. At some point, guys, I'll talk to agents and lawyers and I'll do stuff out there in Hollywood, trust me. I'll have my little boys raised in Hollywood and we'll deal with all the stuff that we deal with there. I'll do that. But ultimately, the film's done. The acting is finished. The costumes are put in boxes. The lights are down out of the studios. The last few bills are paid. And then guess what? I hand that film to you, to the body of Christ. My destiny, the destiny of this film, Tommy, is locked up in someone else. Understand that. That's really, 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 really important. That it's locked up inside of you. Ultimately, the completion of this work is done when you have read the book, 
understand the nuances of what the teaching is, the parable, okay? Jesus said it this way. The disciples came and said, what do you mean by that? Well, you won't have to do that because Tommy's going to write a book in advance, a nonfiction, the teaching of the book of Esther. So when Haman walks in, you can go, oh, that's what that character represents. And then when you bring someone, when you buy 10 tickets <laughs> and give them away to your friends, 100 tickets, when pastors go and buy a whole screening out, you, you want me to tell you something? Let me tell you something really interesting. A hit movie on the weekend, if the weekend happens, okay, Hollywood looks at this. They say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, that's the weekend. And they add up how many people were in the theater that weekend, and that's called a per theater average. That is the number that Hollywood looks at. So Hollywood spends, ready, $40 million dollars to make sure that weekend per theater average is high. The reason that Hollywood was shaken to its core, the reason that Warner Brothers wrote in their release when they released A Walk to, the, to Remember that movie, they said in their press release, the Omega Code created a new genre of film in Hollywood. Okay, that's not my word, that was Warner Brothers, okay? We're in a business conference. I met the former chairman of Warner Brothers last night uh, at the Dove Awards. Steve Case was there. That was a thrill for me. That was cool. Steve Case is in. He founded AOL. And uh, he was at the Dove Awards last night. And then the boys got to meet Kurt Warner, the quarterback. The, that was cool, too. And uh, the Dove Awards, by the way, is, is an incredible TV show. I'm the executive producer for the Dove Awards for the next five years. That's a contract that I just signed. And uh, the show is going to air on TBN on the 25th and the 26th. Uh, I think it's 7 p.m. It'll be in the Praise the Lord slot on April 25th. It's an incredible show. Uh, unbelievable. Business, ready for this? A show booked on top of us from a country and western thing. And they wanted our night. So they spent a half a million dollars on the lighting package. You know how many lights you can rent for a half a million dollars? And then our budget was 40000 but they left their lighting thing because they needed our night, and we switched one night, and then we got $400,000 worth of lights for forty. Okay, you'll see that on the air on the 25th and 26th. So ultimately, I feel this, and then I have one note written down, so let me just see what I had one, I had one note. Okay, you know what's interesting about business? And ultimately, this teaching of what, what's going on with kings and priests revolutionized my thinking. Just revolution my th revolutionized it. It was a big deal to me. And I think that now this, one last statement, right? One last statement? No, I, I'm, I'm really done, really. Watch this. One last thing. If God created all things, do we, how many of us agree that God created all things? Doesn't the Bible declare that? He created all things. A few of you didn't raise your hand, so is there debate? Is there possible debate for that? God created everything, is that true? Yeah, there's debate but no argument, okay? God created all things. Now this is an interesting thought. Tommy, you can preach this if you want. I'll give, this, I'll give you the license on this. Um, I, and I, I don't know how to create messages like you do. I know how to create movies. And I know how to do that. I know how to film them. I know how to select actors. I know how to get the right casting agent, the right costuming and all that. That's easy, okay? I don't know how to create sermons, but I have a thought. Inside of business, when I'm sitting at my desk, how many have sat at your desk in business going, I don't know what to do right now? <laughs> Has that happened to anyone else but me? Okay. I have an agent that is flaming mad and my hold button is blinking I mean madder than a hornet he's gonna rip me up one side and down the other because of a misunderstanding or something and I'm just okay God what do I do you know okay I've been there a few times now we all have if God created all things then then it, you can help me with this because it's really just a thought I had last night so God knows how it's gonna end does he know how er so if he created the beginning, he is the Alpha, the Omega, he created the end. 
So he knows ultimately in, in this dispensation of where we're living and, and us and, you know, from the cross of Christ to, you know, the rapture of the church or whatever is going to ultimately happen. Um, he knows how that's going to be. He knows the beginning and the end. So what could we do along the way to surprise him? And is it possible to surprise God? Is it possible to excite Him? Yeah. Is it possible to please Him? Okay, yeah. He knows what's going to happen. Either I'm going to find a marker in the road or someone else is. Right. Movies are going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. It is going to change the way that people uh, view the gospel in the nations, the generations. It's going to happen. And it could be me or it could be somebody else, depending on how, how I am. The church corner, the new, thank you. Uh, we had a dear friend of ours was looking, standing in line at the Omega Code and getting ready to walk into the theater. And above the door there it said, Omega Code sold out. Omega Code sold out. And the Lord spoke to her and, and gave this testimony to us and said, the Lord spoke to me while I'm standing in an AMC theater, getting ready, you know, lining up, getting ready to go into the theater. And the Lord spoke and said, that is the church corner of the new millennium. Okay, there are hundreds of thousands of theaters around the world. In India, the influence of the movie culture outpaces the influence in America probably a thousand fold. We release in America 400 movies a year, roughly. They release sometimes 4,000 movies a year inside of India. They're crazy for movies there, okay? This is a big deal. So if God knows the beginning and he knows the end, then what can we do along the way that could surprise him? You know what, it could, you know what, you know what I'm suggesting it might be? The way we think about what we're doing when we're sitting in our office. Tommy said, you haven't worshiped until you've worshiped at the table of your enemy. You haven't worshiped until you've worshiped with a bad doctor's report maybe in your hand. You haven't worshiped. So when we're sitting there at our desks and we have someone on hold and it's a bad call, we don't know what to do, would that be the thing that God is looking for is that the surprise that we as businessmen can say we're anointed to be here That's right. the Holy Spirit is with me he is called alongside me right now my mind can say I am in God's I am not just a layman I have the power of the Holy Spirit working with me he's with me right now and someone validated me to be there is that the only thing that we can do to he knows how it's going to end, folks. He knows all things. But what about the way we think? And what about thanking this conference? What about thanking the understanding of being anointed and saying, you know what? Just like the priests are anointed to be and to do what they are called to do, we are anointed to do and to be what we are to do. And we can sit at our desks and our minds and our thinking can be completely changed. And I think that will surprise the Lord. I'm surprised. I'm thrilled. I am a testimony of what this conference and hopefully next year, you know, are we doing one next year? We're doing it at TBN Live? Okay, perfect. We'll do it. God bless you all. Thank you. I love you very much. And my purpose is locked inside of you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for going and seeing the movies. Hallelujah. Let's take the movie theaters back for Jesus. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. Before you go, Brother Matt. Thank you. Just be seated for a moment. Thank you. Brother Larry, before you share, just come and tell the audience what it was like watching Matt perform on TV. And you had a good description. <clears throat> well, we have a little uh, blab cable network in town, our partner does, uh, and I call it the only unrehearsed, uncalled for television show on TV, but we are, we're local, and Matt takes it to an international level. We, 
But it was it was really exciting, and we really appreciate it so much. And and our, we all got our 90 seconds a couple of times and <laughs> kept us on our toes, didn't it? Amen. And I just want your boys, Cody and Caitlin, to come on up here. Would you all do that? Come on here, boys. Stand on up here. Stand on up here, guys. This is the future right here, guys. And uh, I want to tell you all something. That Matt Crouch and his company, they are helping to advance the kingdom of God by taking this gospel to a place it's never been. And they are looking for investors. And if you're an investor here today, you get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with him. And we can help him together make this thing happen. Amen? Amen. But I want to tell you that even though we're going to help Matt and Lori, and I want you all to invest in them, I'm investing in these two because these two are the real men right here. Now, one of the, I think it was this, are you Cody? Well, you should just see them walking around TV and like they own the joint. All right? I mean, they, like, they own the place. And uh, I remember we were there, and um, it was, the place was a zoo. It was crazy, and the cameramen were all over the place. And these guys just zoom in and zoom out, and they duck under the cameras. And, and uh, at one point, this one here, he just took his place, and he was just observing for his grandfather. And the cameraman was saying, like this. And he looked at the cameraman like, you can't be serious, my friend. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, respect you, man. All right? And how old are you again? 16? 13. All right, going on 16. God bless you, boys. Matt and Lori, we love you. Thank you very much. Let's stand and take a one-minute break. Hence, was involved in the family law practice. He has been a partner with the firm of Levin, Papantonio, Thomas, Mitchell, Esner and Proctor, PA since 1988. In 1999, um, excuse me, in 1990, he began to work with his partner, Mike Papantonio, in the area of mass torts. Mr. Morris has represented Brownsville Assembly of God, and he's probably going to share a little bit of that with you today, and Pastor John Kilpatrick since February of 1997. He's been a good friend to us. He's currently the chair of board Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. He's a member of the Board of Directors of Steve Hill's Ministry, Together in the Harvest, and Lyndall Cooley's Ministry, Min Music Missions International. He's a member of the First United Methodist Church, where he has taught Sunday school for over 25 years. He's also has held several leadership positions at his church and currently serves as a lay leader. Mr. Morris also serves on the Board of Directors for Good News, a magazine for the United Methodist Renewal. He's licensed to practice law before all the state courts in Florida and before the United States District Court for the Northern and Mid-Districts of Florida. He's a member of the Association of Trial Lawyers of America, the Florida Bar Association, the Academy of Florida Trial Lawyers, and the Ischemia and Santa Rosa Bar Association, and is an AV-rated lawyer with a Martindale Humble, but most importantly, he's my good friend of mine. Would you make welcome this morning, Larry Morris, this morning. Thank you, Brother Richard. Thank you, Brother Richard. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a real pleasure and privilege to be here. And I want to first, on behalf of the Board of Directors for the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, I want to thank all of our attendees for coming. Thank you so much, and we hope and pray that you will be blessed by this. Um, I certainly have been. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I want, to, I want to thank Ward Simpson and our entire BRSM staff that has put this thing together. Let's give them a hand, please. <laughs> I also want to thank our students because you are our inspiration, believe me. And thank you so much for all that you do and your, your willingness to serve God. I want to thank our speakers, uh, Rich Marshall and Ed Silvosa, Tamara Lowe, Mike Papantonio and Barry Hahn and Matt Crouch and Tommy Tenney. I mean, what a great, great gift they've given us by coming to share with us, and we sincerely appreciate it. 
I want to say that this, this idea, this anointing for business, is a message whose time has come. It's not new. As Rich said, it goes all the way back. It's as old as Judaism itself. It's not new. But it's time for this generation, it's time for preachers to get in their pulpits and, and preach this because we need this generation to be exposed to this idea, to understand it, to claim it, and to apply it to their lives because many of us did not have that growing up and it meant a difference in the way we viewed ourselves. You know, there are different ways. This has been called different things over time. It's been called, now it's being called anointed for business or in the marketplace. But it's been called the ministry of the laity. It's been called the priesthood of the believers. It's been called all of those things. And all of those are true. In my own experience, I sort of began to refer to it as the silent call with the help of my wife. Honey, would you please stand up? My wife, Lynn, I, wanted, I want her to stand up. She was, she's back in the back. Thank you very much because... She, she has been a wonderful inspiration to me for all these years. Um, and she really, she coined that phrase. And I want to tell you why that phrase came about. I want, most, I want you to think back when you were growing up. For those of you that grew up in churches, every time a pastor started talking about the, necess, the, the necessity of being committed to Christ, it usually went along with a statement such as, how many of you would be willing to go to Africa if God called you to do that. That was like the litmus test. And some people were called to that. Reinhard Bonnke is called to that. But most of us weren't. <laughs> and we sort of grew up thinking, you know, well, what about me? Because that idea of being committed and being obedient to God was never equated with a lay profession. It was never equated with being a teacher or being a, a coach, or being a realtor, or being a businessman, or being a restaurateur. It was, those were never, ever mixed. So as a, re, as a result, a whole generation of people struggled. We struggled with the idea of, well, what was wrong with me? Uh, was I just not committed enough? Was I not good enough Christian to be called into ministry? What was wrong with me? I certainly went through that, was I, and I think a lot of people do. And those struggles need to be things of the past. And thank for, thanks to Rich Marshall and Ed Silvosa, this message is getting out there to a whole new generation of people, and I'm so glad. Now, I never heard the call to be a minister. Um, I never did. I know my, my sweet mother probably prayed a thousand times <laughs> that I would, but I never did. Uh, I wanted to be a lawyer. My father was a welder at St. Regis Paper Company, and he was very bright, very intelligent, very well read, and, and he would talk favorably of lawyers and judges who had done things that he admired. When I was being recruited to go to the University of Florida, as a, when I was in high school, I met the first lawyer I ever met. His name was David Levin. Many of you from Pensacola know of David Levin. And David recruited me, and, and, and he was the first lawyer I ever met. David had, he was a young man then, and he had nice clothes. He had a brand new Lincoln Mark I Continental. This was back in the Mark I days. He had a house on the bio. He had everything that a blue collar kid could ever want. And I started thinking, huh, that looks pretty good. By the time I was at the University of Florida, um, this desire to be a lawyer was still there. And I want to make it perfectly clear that in my conscious mind, I never associated being a lawyer, I never became a lawyer out of any spiritual calling. As far as I knew, it was a way for me to make a living, to have some independence, uh, and that was really why I wanted to do it. But as I stand here today, having practiced law for 25 years, I'm convinced that God put that in my heart. He put that ambition in my heart, and I never knew it. I, I believe that with all my heart. Thus, it was a silent call. It was silent, too, because the churches were silent about that possibility. And I want to share with you a few minutes of my personal testimony. It's a personal testimony of God's faithfulness, okay? And that's what all testimonies are. You know, we can say it's our testimony, but it's a testimony of God's faithfulness. And I hope it will encourage you in your profession, in your job, whatever it is, because no matter what it is, you have a particular sphere of influence that is, that is, 
that is unique to you, completely unique to you, because even though you may overlap with other people that have that similar sphere, your personality is completely unique and different. Thus, your sphere of influence is completely unique and different, and God has probably called you to be right where you are. In 1980, I'd been practicing law for about three years, and I was at another firm in town called Emanuel Shepherd and Condon. It was, a, it was a good law firm, and I was very lucky to have been there during the early years of my career. And at that time, I'd handled several divorce cases, and I didn't like them because, man, they're messy. They're ugly. <clears throat> and one day, I made the statement to one of my associates, another fellow young lawyer. I said, man, I would never do that for a living. And let that be a lesson to you. If you've, if you've never had to eat your words, never say never. God has a way of changing our plans. About six months later, one of my partners came to me and said, Larry, um, Miriam Mason is leaving the firm, going to Tampa. She had a, it was a completely a full-time practice, and would you like to consider taking over her law practice, taking over the family law practice? It took all I could do to not only say no, but say, but preface no with a dirty word, no. <laughs> but I didn't. I said, I can't be rude to this partner. I said, well, let me think about it. I went home that night for the first time in my life as a young lawyer, prayed for direction in my legal career. And as I prayed, I heard this in my spirit. When else do people need help more? And I want you to understand, I was not looking for that message. I was not looking for those seven words. I was looking for, no, that's all right, you don't want to do that. But that's not what I got. And that's all I got, but I got that in my spirit. When else do people need help more? And I knew that I, if I was going to be obedient, that I was going to have to answer that call, okay? First time in my career that I began to associate practicing law with doing something that was being obedient to God. I didn't want to be a divorce lawyer because it's extremely emotional. It's heart-wrenching business. Pap and I, years ago, I was at another firm. We used to try divorce cases against each other. And it's tough, tough business. I didn't want to be a divorce lawyer because in a town our size, you can't make a whole lot of money being a divorce lawyer. I'm just being perfectly candid. I didn't want to be a divorce lawyer because, because people didn't respect family lawyers a whole lot, although it really is the most, one of the very most important areas of law that there is because every marriage in America, 50% of them end up in divorce. It's most people's association with the legal field. It's so, so vitally important. But if I was going to be obedient, I had to do that, and I did. And I've got to tell you, I fought it for about a year. After a year, I finally said, all right, we're going for it full force, full force, Lord. And I did it for 11 years. It was, an, it was an amazing experience for me. It was extremely difficult. It brought me to my knees many times as I fought to, to continue doing it. But it also was extremely beneficial to me because it helped me. It helped me mature. It helped me grow helped me understand how precious a marriage is and how that we need to do everything we can to save our marriages. My Sunday mornings at First Methodist Church became more and more important. That hour was so vital and necessary for my spiritual encouragement and recuperation. It was during one of those difficult times when I first remembered hearing John Wesley's covenant prayer. And if you've never heard or read John Wesley's Covenant Prayer, it's the perfect prayer for this thing we're struggling with. That is, what will we do with our lives? And I want to read to you a part of this prayer, and you can understand why as a young lawyer struggling with what he's doing for a living, needing encouragement, needing uplifting, you will understand what this, this prayer meant to me. And I love this prayer. And I, I love to pray it every time we have it at First Methodist Church. And if it's not part of your church service, you need to find this prayer. Listen to this. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy. Others are difficult. Some bring honor. Others reproach. Some are suitable to our no own natural inclinations and temporal interests. And others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power, <clears throat> the, 
the power to do all these things is assuredly given us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make a covenant with God our own. Let us encourage, let us engage our hearts and resolve in His strength to never go back. Being thus prepared, let us now in sincere dependence on His grace and trusting in His promise, yield ourselves anew to Him. And he goes on and says, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me, what, put me where thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt, put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. <clears throat> Don't ever let a preacher tell you that there's no power or blessing in a written prayer. <clears throat> the question, you know, that some people have is how does a how does God use a Christian lawyer in the divorce field? Okay? That messes with people's theology. But let me tell you, we can't put God in our own box, okay? He has, a, he has means and ways and a call that is so different than some of our little ideological boxes we try to put him in. We need to understand that his vision is much broader than ours. During this process of practicing law, I had many, many cases against David Levin, that first lawyer that I ever met. <clears throat> and David Levin was as good a family lawyer as there was in America. I believe that with all my heart. He was respected. He was incredibly bright. And being, him being my adversary made me a better lawyer. I can assure you that. And David Levin ended up being a blessing in my life for years and years. After about, after he and I had tried cases against each other, and believe me, we, even though we were friends, we were adversaries and we butted heads, but we would always be friends afterwards. After uh, those years, David asked me if I would consider joining the Levin Warfield firm it was at the time. And, and I said, well, let me think about it. And I want to share with you this story. Um, for 12 years, I never told anybody this story. I told four people. I told my dear friend and partner, Mike Papantonio. I told my wife. I told my mother and one other dear friend. But this was such a powerful experience that I didn't want to tell too many people because I thought they would think I was crazy. Um, but I'm going to share it with you. I might as well. Matt Crouch got me to share part of it the other night in front of 140 countries and in inter international TV. So I guess the story is out of the bag. But um, December 1986 was a weekend that I had to make up my mind about whether or not I was going to make the, the change to the firm. And um, it was a Saturday morning, and my wife, Lynn, asked me, she said, Honey, what are you going to do? I said, Well, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to make the move. And she said something that I thought was peculiar. She said, Well, you know, you need to think about it again. Men, you need to listen to your wives, okay? And I go home. I mean, I, it was a Saturday morning. I was going to go down to work at my other, at, at the old firm. And I, I, so I got in my car. I drove downtown. And I was going by Seville Tower, which is where our, our firm used to be. And when I got by that firm, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came over me like a heavy, heavy cloud. That's the only way I can describe it. I'd never had an experience like that before. I thought of the three Jewish men going through this incredible fiery trial. I thought of them coming out of the fiery trial and this nation turning to this Yahweh God that they worshiped. And it was just, it was just a heavy, heavy presence of this story. It was so powerful. I stopped. I, did, I said, and I said to, in my sort of prayer, Lord, what is this about? Because I, I did not understand. I'd never had that happen. And it was such a powerful experience. I turned around and drove home and I went and told Lynn what had just happened. Did any of you see the, the cartoon uh, Moses, King of Pharaoh, or, I mean, Moses, Prince of Egypt? Remember there was a scene when, when Moses comes back from the burning bush and he's telling his wife this story, and there's a picture of his wife just sort of sitting down, and you can just tell. She's thinking, man, this guy has lost it. He's seeing a burning bush. Well, when I told my wife that story, that's sort of the way she looked. And I said, honey, either I am delusional 
or God's trying to get me a message to go to this law firm, and I've got to go. I don't know what this means. Maybe it just means I'm supposed to be there, live my life, let my light shine, so to speak, the old scripture that we heard growing up. But anyway, I made that move, and I practiced family law there for about three more years. And then, thank goodness, my friend and, and partner, Mike Papantonio, asked me to come help him in uh, our budding mass tort department. And the only thing we had at that time were our asbestos cases. The truth is, at that time, I was, I was about burned out on family law. I had done it for 11 years. And it was difficult on me because I'm a sensitive person and dealing with that kind of emotion all day, every day, it takes a toll. And some things we're not meant to do forever. There are seasons in our life. <clears throat> and I prayed about it and I felt I could be released from that. And thank goodness I began to work with Mike and he's been an incredible blessing in my life. Talk, <clears throat> talk about having your destiny wrapped up with someone. Mike and I have had that experience. But many, I learned many lessons as a family lawyer that were very, very important years on, and particularly 1997, 1998. It was the first time that I had learned to be obedient to God. It was the first time that I learned the deep peace and satisfaction of being in the will of God, even though you're, the, there's turmoil around you and it's hard and it's difficult, there's a deep peace of knowing you're where, you're God, where God wants you to be. I learned to trust in God during difficult times. You know, God has a great sense of humor. If we're made in his image, then humor's gotta be part of it, doesn't it? Um, because when I was growing up, I had plenty of ambition. I wanted to be a college football player and I wanted to be a successful lawyer in a successful firm. And God gave me all those things and they were blessings. But I gotta confess, I never wanted to be or had the dream to be um, the lawyer for a Pentecostal revival. <laughs> that was drawing that was drawing people from all over the world and drawing media attention and in its own hometown paper getting blasted for about eleven months. That was not in my game plan, okay? Tamara, when I was drawing up the game plan for the football game of my life, that wasn't there. But that event became such an incredible blessing in my life that I will forever, forever thank God for it. The Father's Day Revival began, I mean, the, the Browns Revival began on Father's Day 1995, and, you, and most of you know the history. I came over in August 1995. It was a time in my life when I needed some reviving in my sp spiritual life. And when I say I was obedient to God for those years as a divorce lawyer, I mean that in the macro sense because there were certainly times in the micro sense when I was not obedient to God. But I was touched by this revival. I began to come over once every you know, two or three weeks and I would sit up in the balcony and just watch and I was blessed by it and I was amazed by it. And I saw that John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill and Lyndall Cooley in this church were trying to do everything the right way as well as they could with all that was happening. February 1997, 1997 was the first time that I ever really sat down with John Kilpatrick. Um, it was, he just needed me to help him on a little something. And he and I just sort of meshed, you, we could, there was just some chemistry there that was good the very first time we met. Three weeks after that, I'm riding in my car one day and all of a sudden I think, you know, they need to get ECFA approval, okay, their ministries. Now, I didn't understand. I, I had just heard of what the ECF was, Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. I had just heard about that maybe two or three years earlier. Didn't know anything about it, but I just I, something in my spirit told me that somebody was going to come after them. And so I called John. I said, Pastor, you need to consider this. And he said, absolutely. Yeah, Larry, that's fine. Whatever we need to do. And, and I didn't even know Steve at the time. But he had the same attitude, whatever we need to do to try to do this right, that's fine. And so I got on the phone, tracked down this organization, ordered the applications in March of 1997. Well, up until that point, all the stories in the newspaper had either been positive or at least balanced. And, uh, but in the fall of 1997, I began to hear that, that the newspaper was questioning people and, and they, they sensed an attitude of, or something and they were worried about what was getting ready to happen. 
and I want to emphasize this, okay, I'm very serious about this. I'm not here to say anything bad about the Pensacola News Journal, but the truth is we had a very difficult time for about 11 months. Very, very difficult time is, is a very bland way of saying it. But since then, there's been new leadership, and since then, we've had nothing but good relations with them, and every story has either been positive or at least balanced. So I'm, I'm not here, please understand, I'm not here to say anything ugly. I just want to tell you a story. But we sat down uh, one afternoon, Walter Chandler and I, Walter represented as a lawyer from Gulf Shores, and he represented Steve Hill at the time. And we sat down with the editor of this uh, of the news editor of this series, not the editor of the newspaper, the editor of this series, and I said, what do you, what's going on? I said, I'm hearing different things. And she looked me squarely in the eye and said, the Pensacola News Journal has been criticized by church people and non-church people for not being critical enough of the Browns for Revival. And I went, huh. I knew what that meant. I mean, I knew it meant they were going to be critical, but candidly, I had no idea that it would be as critical as it was. But November 16th, 1997, I go out on a Sunday morning to pick up my newspaper, open it up, front page, banner headlines across the top, the Pensacola, the Browns Revival, the Money's in the Myth, I believe was the name, and it, like four or five articles throughout the paper, just, just coming after this church, your pastor, John Kilpatrick, Steve Hill, the Revival, and this continued, ladies and gentlemen, Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, five mornings. Walking to the newspaper, walking to get the newspaper every morning <laughs> created uh, anxiety and fear. And I think I had some ulcers just getting to the newspaper each morning. Uh, so my role then changes. I'm no longer just the lawyer they call for, a, you know, Larry, what about this, what about that, just minor things. All of a sudden, I'm in a position where I'm trying to lead this church and the pastor through this incredible minefield. And understand, I, I'm just being candid with you, I felt the heat and the pressure of that because this was not, we weren't talking about money, okay? Mike and I deal in pressure situations all the time, big pressure, big money, but this was hearts and souls because it was not unusual, and many of you know, at an altar call where the, the, the front of the church would be completely filled with people and people lined up all the way to the back doors. You couldn't get out of the church on any given night at an altar call because you couldn't get through the people who were on their knees. And so we're in a bad, bad situation. It's tough. This, this church was in a bad situation. My name, my firm's name, we were all caught up in it. We were all in the newspaper. Um, some people said ugly things, I'm sure, to every, probably every church member here. People said ugly things to me. They said ugly things to my wife. Um, there were people in my church that, at First Methodist that were great, encour great encouragers. My pastor, Dr. Henry Roberts, and other people would encourage me. But some people sort of gave me that little smile of avoidance, you know, sort of the, and they'd keep on going. They just didn't want to, they didn't want to engage me, talk to me. And everybody, I'm sure, experienced something like that. On the fifth morning, on Thursday morning, I woke up and I knew I had to speak to Pastor Kilpatrick. I knew that God had put some things in my heart to share with him. And he called me at 7.30 that morning and we talked. And I'm going to share with you just a few things I said because I believe the Holy Spirit gave them to me. I told him that, that this whole thing would make him stronger because he, you know, John has a passion for ministers. And I said, you're going to go through things that most ministers in this world have never gone through. And it's going to make you stronger and make you better able to minister to ministers. I said, if you and Steve had trumped up this Revival, it's toast, <laughs> it's over with, but that's not the case. And this newspaper cannot destroy this revival. They can't do it. But, I said, we can destroy it if we get the wrong attitude. If we get caught up in bitterness and anger and all of these spiritual things that, that, that we shouldn't get involved with. And that morning, I never will forget, my advice was clear 
it was succinct, which is unusual. My wife, my wife can testify that there are times she can't get a sentence out of me because I'm stumbling all over my words. But I hung up the phone that morning, and I hung up the phone, and it was, I felt like a, a cattle prod hit me in the back of the neck, and it buckled my knee, my left knee, and I hung that phone up, and I knew that I was in the crosshairs of God's will for my life at that moment. I mean, you think about, think of the irony of that. Here it is, one of the darkest days of my 25, or at that time, maybe 22, 23 years of practicing law. My friend and client, John Kilpatrick, and this church are being hammered, hammered. But yet, I knew, I knew that all, I knew that all those years of counseling people, I knew that all those years of my religious training, 20 years growing up at this church, 20 years at First Methodist Church, I knew all that stuff had come together for this time. And then in the middle of that fiery furnace was a deep peace that, I, that despite the turmoil, there was a peace in knowing that I was clearly where I needed to be. Well, this was not the end. This continued for months. Um, the pressure began to build to, to consider filing a lawsuit. I was here one night, and a, and a good man who, who loves John Kilpatrick very much, I was here one night for the revival, and he came up to me and he said, Mr. Big Time Lawyer, why can't we stop this? Why can't we sue him? And I tried to explain to him that I had prayed about this long and hard, long and hard, and I just didn't think that it was a thing to do. And I think it's important to understand that, that, you, that lawsuits are a necessary thing. They are a part of the justice system created by God. I don't apologize. I'm proud to be a lawyer. I'm proud to be a trial lawyer because it is part of the justice system. But this was a different occasion. April 1998, okay, four months, five months later, it's still happening. And I don't have time to go into all the detail. I'm just giving you just a few parts of this story. But in April 1998, I'd had to correct the reporter about some issues on a Friday, and I said, well, surely this, what he's going to say Sunday is going to be a decent article. Wrong. <laughs> I went down to Gainesville, came back on a Sunday, and I called John Michael Kilpatrick, pastor's son. I said, on the way back right outside of town, I said, how'd it go? I said, what did the article look like? He said, oh, Larry, it was bad. He said, they, they put Daddy on the front. They superimposed a book on one hand and a video on another, and they tried to make him look like a charlatan. And I was furious. I said, John Michael, we're going to own us a newspaper, and I slammed the phone down. It was a pretty good Peter imitation, really. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a good thing I didn't have a sword. <clears throat> but I go home change clothes, pick up the newspaper, and I see it, and I tell my wife, I said, honey, we're going to sue him. We're going to sue him. I'm tired of this. Get in my car, and I'm driving over to Seminole, Alabama, to because we were having a meeting, and we had many meetings. And now during this time, I'm writing the newspaper, and I'm writing their lawyer, and I'm calling them on the phone, and we're doing all this stuff for months and months. But we had a meeting that afternoon, and again, I'm knowing that they're, gonna look in, they're looking to me for advice. I get in my car and I get on, I'm on the interstate going towards Seminole. I got the, the steering wheel grip and I'm saying, we're going to sue them, by God. And I want you to understand that we can put together a trial team as good as anybody in the country. Mike Papantonio is as good a trial lawyer as there is in America. If you were here yesterday, you got a little taste of that. <clears throat> it's the truth. <sighs> Fred Levin, Fred Levin, I mean, if you're if from this area, I mean, Fred Levin is a nationally known trial lawyer. We can put together a trial team. We've got the finances to back litigation against the biggest, strongest corporations in America, and we do it. So we could have put together a trial team. So I've got it. I mean, I'm ready to go. <clears throat> and I get it on 10, and I'm driving along, and I hear this. Blessed are you when people say false things about you for my name's sake. <clears throat> <laughs> this is a true story and it came to me over and over and over again between Brent Lane and Seminole, Alabama by the time I get to Seminole, Alabama ladies and gentlemen I, I mean 
I'm having a, I'm on a spiritual high. The presence of the Holy Spirit has changed my attitude and changed the advice that I'm getting ready to give my clients completely and totally in that 20 miles. God, it was as though, because that scripture came to me, came in my head so many times, it was as though God was saying, are you going to believe this is true? Is this the word of God or is it sophomore poppycock that doesn't mean anything? It's time to put up or shut up. <clears throat> And, and I happened to know what was happening, and I believed, I believed that that was, that was God. And it completely changed my attitude. Poor John now, i got to understand this, John Kilpatrick's over there. <laughs> and, and I walk in there out of getting out of my car, and I'm just saying, it's going to be a blessing. <laughs> and, and he wasn't quite there yet. But <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it, we, it's good that we can laugh about it now, ladies and gentlemen, because believe me, it was not funny then. <clears throat> but the truth is, the truth is, God did not want the power, the incredible trial skills, the financial backing of the Levin Papantonio Law Firm. God wanted us to trust him. Amen. And that was a powerful, powerful lesson. And it was a pivotal moment in this revival. Um, this anointed for business conference one night during the during all this time this was going on and understand that I prayed time and time and time again Lord give me strength give me wisdom give me courage give me everything I need to try to help these people get through this and and I would go into Mike's office and say pap you know and we'd talk about it and he would help me well, one night I'm sitting in the revival, I was sitting right over in this area, and I'm praying this, I'm praying, Lord, give me strength, give me courage. And in my prayer, all of a sudden in my mind, I've got my eyes closed, and I see a huge, huge vat over my head, and it's full of rich golden oil, and this vat dumps on my head as I'm sitting there, and this is purely, purely in my mind, it was purely in my spirit, but I knew that God was telling me that he had anointed me for this moment to be where I was at that time. <clears throat> and that happened more than once. And it was just a, a means of encouragement, which we all need from time to time. Because a lot of times God doesn't give us a road map. He just says, trust me and keep going. Well, April, August 1998, okay, this is almost, this is nine months later after this starts. It's still happening, but it's starting to wane now. John and, and Steve's ministries are getting through the ECFA approval, and I believe the paper, the, the writers are finally saying, you know, they are doing things right, aren't they? And it's starting to die down, and I, I go with John and Steve and Lindell to a, the first Awake America, and only Awake America I went to at, at Penn State University. And... I go out there, and right before the meeting, I, I'm walking into this Coliseum. And I walk down, listen to this now. I walk down one aisle, and I start looking at the tags. In one aisle, there were tags from New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Rhode Island, Maine, Vermont, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and probably a few more. Down one aisle, as I'm walking into this Coliseum, and I'm thinking, man, people are coming from all over the place. To this Awake America. And of course, they're coming to Brownsville from all over the world all the time. And I remember how that struck me. I get in the building and pastor says, well, Larry, why don't you come out there on the podium with me? And I said, well, I said, are you sure you want a plaintiff's lawyer out there with a bunch of Pentecostal preachers? And, <laughs> and he said, yeah, come on, I think you'll enjoy it. So I go out there and it was an amazing experience. This Coliseum was huge, Everything but the top rows were filled with people. It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful, wonderful service. They did an altar call, moved all the chairs off the floor. Steve gives the altar call. People start coming to the altar. They completely, completely fill this big, team, big Ten Coliseum floor. People start dropping on their knees in the aisles because they couldn't get to the floor. It was an absolutely amazing scene. After the altar call, they began to have the prayer time, and I stay up on the podium and, and, and start to pray. And the Holy Spirit just starts to wash over me, and it, it's starting to comfort me, saying, this is coming to an end. It's about over with. And it was, it was a powerful, powerful 
time of prayer for me individually. And out of nowhere, I think of John Kilpatrick, Steve Hill, Lyndall Cooley, going through this fiery trial, coming out on the other side of it. People are coming from all over the world, all over the nation, and being touched by this revival. And I think, is that what that was about in 1986? And I believe it was. I believe it was part of it. I believe, I believe God wanted me at the Levin Papantonio firm because several things. Number one, we're not afraid of controversy. I mean, it, we're a plaintiff's firm. It's a bunch of mavericks, and you know, people say bad things about us, and we're not. <laughs> it's not new, okay? And all of my partners, not one partner came to me during any of that and said, "Larry, you need to. This is this is this is too nasty. You know, you need to get out of this." Not one partner came to me and said, you're not charging them anything for all this time you're giving them. I had the political freedom. I had the financial freedom to be able to represent this church during that revival. <laughs> but understand that I could never have done that had I not been partners with Mike Papantonio because we were creating enough income there at that time that no one could come to me and say, you're not producing what you should. I mean, we're partners. We're all owners in the business, but we all have obligations to do our job and to create income. But nobody could say that because we were creating enough income that we had the ability to, that, that nobody could fault us. And so I will, and I will forever, forever be indebted to my law firm to my partners for giving me that freedom for Fred Levin, Mike Papantonio, Mark Proctor, Martin Levin, David Levin, David was still alive then. All of those people were incredible blessings to me and they were incredible blessing to this church. One of the wonderful ironies of all of this is that, and John and I spoke about this a little bit yesterday, when I made the move to, the, to our firm in 1987, there were some Christian folks in town that were wondering, what is he doing going over to that plaintiff's law firm? I'm serious, okay? Again, we all get little preconceived ideas that aren't necessarily God's ideas. And God was able to use this law firm to help this church and to help this ministry. And I will forever, forever be indebted to my partners for, for having that kind of freedom. In closing, within a, within a year, of, of all this starting, maybe a year and a few months, the editor of the paper, the editor-in-chief of the paper, and the main author of those articles all left the Pensacola News Journal. And I don't know why, I mean, uh, but a, a new editor came in, and the new editor, Randy Hammer, took all of those articles, I wrote him a letter and asked him to do this, he wrote all, took all those articles off of their website, and God has prospered them. They're nominated now for a Pulitzer Prize, and I'm perfectly happy about that because they've been, they have been fair to us in the last two, two and a half or three years. During all this time, one of the things, scriptures, that I kept hearing was not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I've never said this publicly, but I'm going to say it, and you can draw from it what you will. But from November 1997... For the next five years, our firm, which had always been a very successful firm, was the most successful financially that we'd ever been in the history of our firm. Yes. I'm thanking God for that. Yes. <clears throat> and I want to I say this, my respect, love, and appreciation for John Kilpatrick grew and grew and grew because we went through an incredible fiery trial ladies and gentlemen this man got hammered like you've never seen and he never once struck out in anger he never he never took the bait to to get an attitude that he shouldn't have he was hurt to the core i can promise you that any human being would have been but he kept the right attitude, and God has honored him, and he's honored this church because they kept that attitude. And I just want to say that being a part of this re revival, having that little part that I had, was one of the most meaningful, powerful experiences of my 25 years practicing law. And I will forever be indebted to John Kilpatrick and this church, and Lyndall Cooley and Steve Hill, for all that they did during that revival.
Let me just conclude by saying this. As we consider ourselves in the marketplace, we've got to keep several things in mind. Number one, we've got to be good at what we do. We need to be the best we can be at whatever you're doing. I don't care what it is. Be the best you can be because our actions speak very loud. We need to be good about the way we treat our coworkers, our employees, how we treat our competitors, how we treat our adversaries because all of those things matter because we're going to be judged by our actions, okay? We're going to be judged by our actions. We have a little different job description than the evangelist. And, and people have sort of different ideas maybe on this. I'm going to give you my ideas, and you've got to flesh it out yourself, okay? But we have a little different job description. Steve Hill is an evangelist with a capital E. It's a title. He is judged by what he does behind the pulpit, how well he preaches the gospel, okay? Then there are only a few people see him his personal life, very few. Most people see him behind a, a platform. You and I are judged by our actions day to day. And if our actions aren't consistent with what we say, then what we say is not going to mount to a hill of beans. We're going to do more harm than good. So we've got to be careful with our examples. And I'm going to give you a quick story, and I'm going to end this. A couple of months ago, I'm in Dallas, Texas, and we've been negotiating with a, a very, very capable lawyer from New York. He, he only negotiates cases for the, the biggest corporations in the world. He's very good. He's a Jewish lawyer from New York. And we've worked with him for about a year. We've got to know each other. And even though we're adversaries, we have a, we've built up a mutual respect. And I'm having dinner in Dallas one night at a steakhouse. And it's me and, and, and him and Rick Kirkendall, an attorney that helps us so much with our firm. And, and a lawyer from Mississippi named Roe Frazier. Because I'm the negotiator and Pap's a trial lawyer, believe me, they'd rather talk to me than, than face Pap in the courtroom. So we're talking, trying to make peace. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere, this lawyer turns to me and, and, and Rick and Roe were talking and, and, and Mike turns to me and says, he takes on this voice of a Texas lawyer who I know of and he says, Hi, my name's so-and-so, and I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. And by golly, you better give me the blankety-blank money, or I'm going to kick your blankety-blank. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering, where is it? What's this coming from? Then he switches to the voice of a lawyer from Alabama that I know. And he says, Hi, I'm so-and-so, and, and I'm a Christian, and I love Jesus, and I can work with you too, and... Uh, and we'll see if we can work together. Then he goes to his own voice and he says, you know, Larry, that's what I have to put up with. And I turned to this lawyer and I said, well, okay, fine, but where were your people when 200 of my family were getting killed at Auschwitz? And I'm, I'm blown back, ladies and gentlemen. I gotta admit, I didn't know what to say. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Mike, I hope I've never offended you. Um, and, and we talked for a few more minutes. He said, no, 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 you haven't. He said, I wasn't directing that at you. Uh, and he said some very complimentary things. And I walked away, walked away that night thinking, what was that about? I mean, I didn't know what to think. And I went back to my room and I still was pondering. Two days later, I'm taking a shower and all of a sudden it hits me. What a great example of things we can't do as Christian people in the business place, okay? We can't be like the first lawyer was, inconsistent. He's talking in one sentence about how much he loves Jesus, and the next minute he's cussing the guy out, demanding a bunch of money in a rude, crude way. We can't be inconsistent. We can't be like the other guy, maybe wearing our faith too far out there on our sleeve before we've established any credibility with anybody, and thus we've offended somebody totally, so we've got to be careful about what we do and how we say it. We've got to be patient, okay? You know, Emmett Smith, we had Emmett Smith Day here the other day, the greatest running back in NFL history. There have been many running backs, ladies and gentlemen. I played college football and I know talent. There have been many running backs bigger, stronger, and faster than Emmett Smith, okay? But what Emmett Smith did that was so great, one of the things, was that he was patient and he waited for his blockers to open holes and when he saw the hole, he hit the hole. 
One of the things that we've got to do is understand that the Holy Spirit will be our blocker and He will open up holes that we can hit the hole and speak at the right time, at the right way, okay? Because if you start running, if you get too anxious and say too much too fast, you can do a whole lot more harm than you do good. So we have to use some wisdom. We must remember that this job will not always be an easy one. Like Tamara said the other day, it's war. It's war because it's the difference between being a spectator at a football game and being on the field. And I've done both. When I'm in the stands, I'm sitting there watching. I remember a couple of years ago, I'm at a Florida-Florida State game. Florida fullback breaks his ankle, and he's writhing in pain. And I'm not even, I'm not feeling his pain. I'm not hearing him scream. I'm just removed from it. And I thought back to when I was a, a player, and I was on the sidelines. And every time the ball snapped, it was like a war erupted. If you would be amazed at the sound of the violence on a football field every play that the ball has snapped. And it's, you, know, you get closer to the battle, and it gets louder, it gets tougher. When you get on the field, you get on the field, in the game, and it gets tough. Somebody's going to try to take your head off. This church, this pastor, we're in the game. They're still in the game. You are going to be in the game, and you've got to understand that you're going to have difficulties, you're going to have trials, and you've got to keep the faith. You've got to trust in God during the hard, hard times when you don't feel like it, when you look around you and there's no reason to trust Him, you've got to trust God, and He will honor that. My pastor, Henry Roberts, said this a couple of weeks ago, and I said something that's a challenge we all need to keep put deep in our heart. Our only hope is taking radically serious the teachings of Jesus Christ. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If there's not a shadow of the cross on the road that you are traveling, then maybe you're on the wrong road. I'm convinced that the vast majority of the work of the kingdom of God must be done by you and I as kings, men and women in the marketplace. The fields that need to be harvested are not in the churches. They're outside of the walls of the church. They're in every job site, every school, every restaurant, every garage, every law office, every hospital, courthouse, doctor's office, nursing home, locker room, real estate office, all across this world. And let us take seriously the silent call into his king's service. Let us pray that God will give us a vision and the commensurate dedication discipline and courage to fulfill the task that he's put before us. Thank you so much.